case for federal prosecution. This woman defied both the law and the Constitution. As U.S. Attorney, it's my duty to bring the power of the law against anyone who would assault the peace and the dignity of the nation. Susan B. Anthony, why can't you be more like the women around you? They let their husbands and brothers and fathers decide. Maybe someday Susan B. Anthony for her 201st birthday. Just as children did, eight, when she was 80 years old, I presented her with yellow roses just like these. I'm also carrying some suffrage monikers here. These are sunflowers, and they are also the state flower of Kansas, which was one of the first states to show a big interest in women's voting. The museum mission of the Susan B. Anthony birthplace is to preserve the birthplace and raise public awareness of the wide-ranging legacy of the prominent social reformer of the 19th century. As a noteworthy figure in suffrage, abolitionist, anti-restalism, and temperance movements, Susan B. Anthony advocated for the women's vote while opposing slavery, abortion, and alcohol. Each year since its founding, the Susan B. Anthony Museum has had a public birthday celebration to honor Susan. But this year, in response to the challenges of the virus, we are having a virtual celebration instead. Our theme this year, which happens to be the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in America, um, our theme is Susan B. Anthony, the great teacher. She taught children and then the world. Hello, I'm Steve Adams, and this is A Fine Agitation. Together, we'll explore some of the people and events that helped shape the 72-year struggle for women's suffrage in America, culminating in the 19th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and ratified just over 100 years ago. The organizers of the event, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and Mary Ann McClintock, crafted their declaration after the Declaration of Independence. It described the many ways that women's economic, social, and religious rights have been denied by the laws of men. The Declaration of Sentiments included 11 resolutions describing how women would gain their rights. Ten were adopted without debate. Only one, the resolution demanding the right to vote, caused a stir among the assembled. Even for these activists, women's suffrage was considered too radical a step. The suffrage resolution would pass by a narrow margin that day but it would become the cornerstone of the women's rights movement for the next seven decades. This song imagines how Elizabeth Cady Stanton may have felt after the successful conclusion of the convention.
And some things were different. The Seneca Falls Convention was followed by women's rights meetings across New York, in Massachusetts, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Indiana. Within two years, there were so many regional efforts that the first National Women's Rights Convention was convened. It was held in Worcester, Massachusetts, and attended by over 1,000 women and men from 11 different states. It would be repeated every year in a different location and enjoyed a growing number of women attendants. A movement had begun. It would be three years following Seneca Falls before another momentous meeting in that small city. Elizabeth Cady Stanton would meet the woman who would become her lifelong colleague and dearest friend, Susan B. Anthony. Together, the two women would fight tirelessly for women's rights and especially the right to vote. Stanton was a fiery mother of seven who disavowed organized religion, and Anthony was a single-minded, unmarried Quaker from Rochester. Despite their differences, their partnership would form the beating heart of the women's rights movement for the half a century. In this song, Elizabeth Cady Stanton reflects hopefully on their first 15 years of work together, unaware that their journey had just begun. When will I next see my dear friend from Rochester? It seems like we're always saying goodbye It's been too long since I've seen Susan Anthony Crossing my lawn with that gleam in her eye We've been together since this all began Me with the speeches and her with the plans No matter how rough or improbable It's clear to see Well, I miss the years when we traveled together Fighting our rivals, both women and men well, Now that I'm homebound by duty and family I fight our cause with the tip of my pen it's taken decades for people to learn But soon we'll end slavery Then we'll have our turn No matter the bar or the obstacle We both believe Failure's impossible Most of the suffragists were also abolitionists, so with the outbreak of the Civil War, they suspended their push for women's rights and dedicated themselves to the cause of the Union. In so doing, they hoped to end slavery once and for all, and perhaps win the favor of a grateful nation and be awarded the vote. Suffragists showed themselves to be a potent political force. When Congress began to water down the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery, suffragists gathered 400,000 signatures demanding an unqualified abolition slavery across the entire nation. With the war over and slavery ended, suffragists began thinking that perhaps their time had finally come. They formed the American Equal Rights Association to push for universal suffrage, equal voting rights for all men, all women, black and white. In this song, a cautiously optimistic Susan B. Anthony considers the possibilities. Whoa. 
was nearly three years over And the nations won again We pulled together for the union And to bring slavery to an end So maybe this can be our moment For 20 years we made our case We've earned the right to be made equal take our rightful place we've thrown our hearts in the arms of a promise but we the people shall be free with equal rights for men and women then hand in hand in hand we can finally build a land of liberty Say it's time our cause was heard We could be voting next November If we could take them at their word Well in my dreams I see a river Ribbons of purple, white, and gold. Thousands of women marching forward. Winning the dream we had foretold. I fell our hearts in the arms of a promise. That we, the people, shall be free. With equal rights for men and women Then hand in hand in hand We can finally build a land of liberty We've thrown our hearts in the arms of a promise That we the people shall be free With equal rights for men and women Then hand in hand can finally build a land of liberty, of liberty, a land of liberty, a land of liberty, a land we are meant to be, a land of liberty, a land we were meant to be, a land we were meant to be, a land of liberty. Suffrage's hope were quickly dashed with the introduction of the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Rather than universal suffrage, the amendment would extend the right to vote to black men but not to women. Frederick Douglass had been a women's rights man since Seneca Falls. It was his argument that the vote was essential to women achieving other rights that helped carry the day for suffrage at Seneca Falls. Now, 20 years later, Douglass would argue that black men needed the vote more urgently than women. In this song, Frederick Douglass explains why the 15th Amendment was a necessary step in the path to universal suffrage. Why should I feel so conflicted? Haven't I stood by you from the start? Why can't you be more realistic? Search your heart. No man better knows your struggle But our moment, it may never come again Would you have us fall with you When we can only make it through without you?
You can't make it this time. You cannot make it this time. You don't have the votes or the power. When we get our due, we'll help pull you through. But this is the black man's hour. You say we shouldn't split the choir. But our struggles in the end, they're not the same. The stakes for us are so much higher than you can claim. as you argue for more privilege us black men we are fighting for our lives if they were murdering your kin just because you were women I'd be with you but you can't make it this time you cannot make it this time you don't have the votes or the power when we get our due well we'll help pull you through but this is the black man's hour sister I can feel your consternation after 20 years of work, you feel betrayed. We will end women's subjugation, but not today, my old friend. So please don't say that I'm disloyal. This is the only path that we can see. Don't you see you're asking us to choose between the ballot and the news when you know, and you know, you can't make it this time. You cannot make it this time. You don't have the votes or the when we get our due, well, we'll help pull you through. But this is the black man's hour. When we get our due, we'll help pull you through. But this is the black man's hour. Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and many of the suffragists were deeply disappointed and angry that politicians and abolitionists were supporting a 15th Amendment that would extend the vote to black men but not to women. In this song, Susan B. Anthony debates Frederick Douglass on the matter.
must hold to our battle plan every woman every man we stand together or we fall apart how can i change your mind while there's still some time but i can't help feel the walls are closing in how much longer must we wait women suffrage at this rate seems another lifetime away The fight over the 15th Amendment would drive a wedge into the suffrage movement that would last for 20 years and leave a scar in the women's rights movement that remains today. But the fight for suffrage would continue. I'll be back after this. Our next guest is a staple at all of the Susan B. Anthony birthday celebrations, and that is the famous local historian, Eugene Michalenko. He is going to be speaking about our theme today. Susan B. Anthony, the great teacher. Take it away. Susan B. Anthony is one of those unique people in history who dedicated her life to making people better than what they are. And that is not an easy task. The lesson that I have taken away from her life's work is that we should hold strong to our faith and belief in democracy. The democracy that our founding fathers laid out based on the philosophical thought in the age of reason, the Enlightenment. Four score and seven years later, Abraham Lincoln affirmed that in his Gettysburg Address. Our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that everyone was created equal. Susan believed everything that the Founding Fathers said but she wanted them to come true. For her, the American Revolution didn't end with war and a treaty, but it is an ongoing, continuous revolution. Its manifesto is declared in the preamble of one of our founding documents. I quote, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of, to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Susan B. Anthony's struggle to achieve equal rights is called, by some historians, the Second American Revolution. She continued the work of our founding fathers. She struggled to establish justice to promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to half of the population of these United States. For her, democracy, establishing a government from the consent of the governed, was the path to a better world for everyone. 
When more people are gathered in to make a decision, a better decision is made. When the gathering includes a diverse mix of experiences with a common aim to promote the general welfare, a better solution is achieved. On this 201st anniversary of Susan's birth, let's renew our belief in democracy and pledge our allegiance to liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Hi, everyone. Pat here again. This time, I have the pleasure of interviewing Martin Lohman. He is a former intern at the Susan B. Anthony Birthplace Museum, and guess what? A gift shop clerk, is that the right term? Yes. And docent. He really does everything at this museum. It's quite valuable, and he's not only that, he's created something quite special and unique, a completely brand new museum exhibit that you can interact with on your computer. Specifically, an interactive video tour of the Museum of Our Floors. Well, welcome, Marty. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thanks. Great. Can you please tell us how you came to create this new interactive tour, and why did you choose to tour the upper floors of the museum? Well, I, when I was in college, I had just finished a course on the basics of making a video game, and then when I was looking for an internship, I had suggested to the museum director I could make a virtual tour of the upper floors because those are closed to the public and have them historically set like when Susan's family would have lived here. She really liked the idea of a virtual tour that looked like a video game because she thought it was a good way to get children interested in history. That's very cool. And so you said that the upper floors are closed. In other words, why, why are they closed to the public? They're currently office space. I see. Oh, that makes perfect sense. I read about your exhibit, and it said that it was a, quote, 3D digital production, I believe. Could you explain what that means? Uh, yes. Uh, when I said it was digital, I meant it was on the computer, and the 3D is because the items in the tour look like they have depth, and you can look at them from multiple angles. That's great. That really sounds like fun. Um, video games, what's not to like? Hmm. This, and for history, parents, keep your ears open. Um, Marty, would you mind giving us a taste, just a little taste, of what touring one of your favorite upstairs rooms might look like, please? Sure. Hello, welcome to the upper floors of the Susan B. Anthony Birthplace Museum. Let's take a walk around one of my favorite rooms in the home. This was Susan's bedroom. Among other things in the room, as you can see, there was a cradle and Susan's mother's rocking chair. When you walk up to certain items in the room, uh, like this rocking chair, an information box will pop up that explains what you're looking at. It says, this is Lucy's rocking chair. It was a gift received upon the birth of her first child. Other interesting things are the windows. Uh, it explains what you can see out the windows. From this window can be seen a tavern at the street corner. There are even more things for you to walk around the house and discover. All right, well, thank you, Marty. That was wonderful. Please don't go away now. There is a very special first time ever award that's about to be given uh, from the museum to a certain person. And by the way, that happens to be you. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations, Marty. Thank you. All right. At this time, I'd like to introduce the audience to attorney James Lohman, the vice president of the board at the Susan B. Anthony Birthplace Museum. How are you doing today, Jim? Fine, thanks. Great. He's going to present our Distinguished Service Award to Martin Lohman. This is a brand new award. It's never been awarded before, but we created it after the, some of the committee members for the Birthplace Association decided that we, couldn't, we had to honor Martin Lohman for his great work. This happened um, after a board meeting where in People were talking and getting very excited about all the work that Marty did. 
And we decided that we should make an award for him to encourage other people in the neighborhood, in the country even, to come up with something for the museum. Yeah. Well, now I'd like to just turn to um, Jim. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. It's my great honor as the Vice President of the Board of the Susan B. Anthony Birthplace Museum to present our first ever Distinguished Service Award to my son, Martin Lohman, for his uh, virtual interactive tour of the upstairs of the museum. Congratulations, Martin. Thank you. Congratulations, Martin. And let's just get a quick look of this beautiful plaque here. The Susan B. Anthony Birthplace Museum Board of Directors Distinguished Service Award 2020, Martin Lohman. Thanks again, Marty. You're welcome. Back again. It's time for part two to finish up a fine agitation with Steve Adams. Enjoy. Welcome back. Having failed to win the vote by legislation, suffragists tried to gain it through the courts. They hoped that by bringing the issue to federal court, the courts would affirm their right to vote as citizens. In 1872, Susan B. Anthony roused her mother from her sickbed, gathered her three sisters and ten of their friends, and marched down to a local barber shop in Rochester's 8th Ward and registered to vote. A few days later, they returned to cast their vote in the presidential election. Anthony immediately wrote to Stanton, I have been and gone and done it. We will have a fine agitation in Rochester. At first, federal officials weren't sure how to respond. Bringing the famous Susan B. Anthony to trial would discourage others from repeating her act. But the wrong verdict would enfranchise women across the country overnight. In the end, they decided to prosecute. No need to worry. The fix was in. This song describes the trial of Susan B. Anthony through the eyes of U.S. Attorney Richard Crowley and federal judge Ward Hunt. She brought 14 gals to the polls. Next time she'll bring 1,400, I'm told. Must crush this now before they build up momentum. Your denial of my citizens' right to vote is the denial of my right of consent as one of the governed, the denial of my right of representation as one of the tax, the denial of my right to a trial by jury of my peers as an offender against the law. Therefore, the denial of my sacred right to life, liberty, property, continue to urge all women to the practical recognition of the old revolutionary maxim, resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. 
Anthony's trial gained the cause national attention, but the federal court strategy ultimately failed when the Supreme Court ruled on another case that the 15th Amendment did not give women the right to vote. So it was back to the long slog of traveling the country, lobbying state legislatures, and petitioning Congress year after year. Divided by the schism over the 15th Amendment, the suffrage movement was hobbled. The Chicago World's Fair of 1893 marked a major turning point in America's place in the world. It also marked a significant change in the public's perception of suffrage and those who championed it. After decades of scorn and derision, Susan B. Anthony, who spoke at the fair, found herself to be among the most honored and popular participants. Here, a female reporter covering the fair describes the day Susan B. Anthony met Buffalo Bill Cody at his Wild West show. It opened in May on a bright sun-drenched day No one ever had seen such a wondrous sight From a windswept savannah arose a spectacular Shimmering city of light Its triumphant rise from Chicago's south side As unlikely as my presence there from small town schoolmistress to big city journalist covering Chicago's World's Fair. I earned my dimes at the Chicago Times trying to follow the footsteps of brave Nellie Bly. A woman reporter, they tested my mortar with mischief and passes and jibes. When the men came around, I could stand my own ground, but I hadn't the courage to say that behind my press card beat a suffragette's heart. And I know that I'll put one day. The fair launched the nation upon the world stage. America finally coming of age. And with all of the spectacle, none can compare to when Susan B. Anthony rocked the Chicago World's Fair. When I got to the fair, not one whit did I care for the modern machinery or rare oddities. With my press credentials, I pushed through the crowd to hear Miss Susan B. Anthony. A lifetime of toil in the hard suffrage soil, I expected a stern look of steel. Ah, but there was more grace in Miss Anthony's face than the turn of George Ferris's wheel. To go by, and to my great surprise, lead a company into the Wild West show. So I followed them in, and I witnessed a moment like no other I'd ever known. The audience still to see Buffalo Bill race across the arena, a one horse stampede. As the white horse and rider reared up beside her, he bowed low to Miss Anthony. Rising in her black suit, she returned the salute. Then the roar of the crowd filled the air. I will never forget the day Susan B. Anthony rocked the Chicago World's Fair. I will never forget the day Susan B. Anthony rocked the Chicago World's Fair.
Anthony and Stanton continued to fight for women's rights well into their 80s, but they realized that success was beyond their reach. So a new generation of women was recruited to take up the cause. These women often referred to Anthony as Aunt Susan. Several were with her in Rochester on that rainy October day in 1902 when word arrived that Elizabeth Cady Stanton had died. In this song, Susan B. Anthony reflects on their work and life together at the learning of the death of her friend. Anthony would die in 1906, 14 years before the 19th Amendment named for her would be ratified. Another generation of women would take the cause to a successful end. Alice Paul, a Quaker like Anthony, led the radical arm of the suffrage movement. She and members of her National Women's Party would stage a march on Washington and picket President Wilson's White House. They willingly suffered derision, arrest, imprisonment for months, beatings and forced feedings, for the crime of standing silently in front of the White House. Ida B. Wells was a friend and occasional visitor of Susan B. Anthony. The African-American journalist created the Alpha Suffrage Club in Illinois and organized black women in the fight for voting rights. She would take Anthony to task for her willingness to hold black women at arm's length in order to keep southern white women in the movement. And she would defy Alice Paul's efforts to make her march at the back of the Washington Parade. Carrie Chapman Catt, like Anthony before her, was president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. 
Her maiden name was Lane, and Cat Anthony chastised her for not restoring her maiden name after her first husband, Leo Chapman, had died. Cat would spearhead the monumental effort to convince 36 state legislatures to ratify the 19th Amendment. On August 18, 1920, all eyes were on the Tennessee State House in Memphis. It was the last chance to get the 36th state. Legislators opposed to suffrage wore red roses in their lapels. Supporters wore yellow. As the measure came up for a roll call, Cat was counting the votes, and it wasn't looking good. In this song, these three leaders of the final push for women's suffrage looked to Susan B. Anthony for inspiration. This road so much harder without you I know we'll get there I just can't see how Failure's impossible So we'll see it through You taught us failure's impossible So we'll see it through Dear Anne and Susan It's Alice Paul Sometimes I wonder why I shoulder it all The cruel beatings, the forced beatings But just like you, I answer the call Dear Aunt Susan From your years of trial to my prison cell Each of us battles our own version of hell your hands on the plow you must push till you're through though we've never met that's my vision of you dear aunt susan where are you now this road so much harder without you i know we'll get there just can't see how failure's impossible we'll see it through you taught us failure's impossible we'll see it through dear and susan it's ida b i miss your cozy guest room down on madison street the girls you put in charge are not as welcome then as you would be. Dear Aunt Susan, can't understand your embrace of the South. When keeping them in means keeping black women out. You said that you needed their voice to succeed. But it's just made things much harder than they need to be. out to you for the courage to finish the fight dear Aunt Susan after all that we've done it comes down to this a Tennessee state house a prayer and a wish but to find you in suffrage will take more than our prayers maybe you can speak to someone Someone up there Dear Aunt Susan Where are you now? This road so much harder without you We know we'll get there We 
just can't see how. Failure's impossible, we'll see it through. You taught us failure's impossible, we'll see it through. Failure's impossible, we'll see it through. Whatever it takes, we'll see it through. Just when it looked like all was lost, Tennessee's youngest legislator, Harry Byrne, had a change of heart. He wore a red rose into the chamber that day, but also carried a letter from his mother urging him to vote for suffrage. He would cast the vote that would allow Tennessee to ratify the 19th Amendment. Somehow, against all odds, the suffragists had finally removed the gender barrier to voting. Overnight, 20 million women would be enfranchised. It would be another 45 years before the Voting Rights Act would eliminate barriers that denied the ballot to nearly half of all black women and men who were living in the southern states. But the passage of the 19th Amendment was a crucial step in the path to universal suffrage. Here is Carrie Chapman Catt celebrating the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Ours has been a cause to live for, a cause to die for if need be. It has been a movement with a soul, a dauntless, unconquerable soul ever leading onward. Women came, served, and passed on, but others took their places. How I pity the women who have had no share in the exultation and the discipline of our army of workers. How I pity those who have not felt the grip of the oneness of women struggling, serving, suffering, sacrificing for the righteousness of women's emancipation. Oh, women, be glad today. And let your voices ring out the gladness in your hearts. Let joy be unconfined and let it speak so clearly that its echo will be heard around the world and find its way into the soul of every woman of every race who is yearning for opportunity and liberty this is still the song denied. Of the women sung to the marching of feet mothers and daughters of mothers out in the crowded street yea and the mothers of mothers gray with the passing of years oh this is the song of the women and wise are the men who hear we have envisioned a future that has lured us with its gleam. And the marching lines and the tramping feet are all on the trail of a dream. We've envisioned a social justice that shall cripple the tyrant schemes. The weak and the poor and the thwarted, empowered to reach for their dreams. This is the song of the women, sung to the marching of feet. Mothers and daughters of mothers, out in the crowded street. Yea, and the mothers of mothers, gray with the passing of years. This is the song of the women, and wise are the men who hear. This is the song of the women, and wise are the men who hear. Thank you for joining me in this celebration of Susan B. Anthony and the suffragists she led and inspired. I'm Steve Adams. Be sure you're registered. Be sure you vote. Thank you, Steve, for your fine tribute to Susan B. Anthony. Well, I am so happy to close this program with a very, very special guest. Her name is Imogen Guerin. And get this, she happens to be a model, and not just a model for any person. She is a model for the Susan B. Anthony Child Statue, which um, is going to be unveiled and in Adams, Massachusetts, sometime this coming year. She's going to sing Happy Birthday for us. And you can sing along too. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye.
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Susan B. Anthony. Happy birthday to you. said and it's time for the museum to say a hearty thank you to our major sponsors which includes Steve Adams himself our balladeer thank you Steve for donating your time making the recordings and just being so interested in composing this music for the museum it's a treasure we also want to thank Paul Marino that is Paul W. Marino, Program Director at Northern Berkshire Community Television Corporation. We want to thank him for filming. That is, oh, we have to use the modern word, Miss Pat, for recording, advising, and editing this whole program. We thank you and we're indebted to you. It's been a pleasure working with you. Thanks to Mr. Michael Enkel, our historian and president of the Adams Historical Society for all his help every year, giving some words of wisdom about Susan. Thanks to especially to the whole Loman family for their help uh, getting us set up for Jim, giving us his advice and his whole family um, helping. I think that's everyone except for the committee Colleen Spellacy, and Kathy Peters, and all of the board members, Carol, and of course Carol, our founder and president of the Susan B. Anthony celebration. When the men came around, I could stand my own ground, but I hadn't the courage to say that behind. My press card beat a suffragette's heart And I know that I'll be one day The fair launched the nation upon the world stage America finally coming of age And with all of the spectacle none can compare To when Susan B. Anthony rocked the Chicago World's Fair When I got to the fair, not one whit did I care For the modern machinery or rare oddities With my press credentials, I pushed through the crowd To hear Miss Susan B. Anthony A lifetime of toil in the hard suffrage soil I expected a stern look of steel Oh, but there was more grace in Miss Anthony's face than the turn of George Ferris's wheel. I watched her go by, and to my great surprise, lead a company into the Wild West show. So I followed them in, and I witnessed a moment like no other I'd ever known. The audience still to see Buffalo Bill race across the arena, a one-horse stampede, as the white horse and rider reared up beside her, he bowed low to Miss Anthony. Rising in her black suit, she returned the salute, then the roar of the crowd filled the air. I will never forget the day Susan B. Anthony rocked the Chicago World's Fair. I will never forget the day Susan B. Anthony rocked the Chicago World's Fair.